Now, they know that originally, they assume that, it, they also know the universe started. It began. That's what they, for lack of another term, they call a singularity. And that leads to conjectures of how did it start. And that leads to a collection of speculations called the Big Bang theories. And basically, they say, first there was nothing, and then it exploded. If that's logical to you, embrace it. But we also know that ultimately, it's all going to burn out. The universe is winding, it's been wound up, it's winding down. And there's ultimately a heat death. You see, heat flows always from hot bodies to cold bodies, right? We all experience that. If the universe was infinitely old, the temperature throughout the universe would be uniform. It's not. So it's not infinitely old. It had a beginning. That's what leads to the whole Big Bang concept. And so it had a beginning. And that's, that's clearly understood. Lots of speculation as to what actually occurred then. Okay. But it's also designed for an ending because eventually there's good, the, temperatures in the, uniform will be, the, the temperatures in the universe will be uniform. All work is done by a difference in temperature. When the temperatures are uniform, no more work can be done. The uniform is over. And it is destined for what they call a heat death. Now, there are lots of different speculations about the Big Bang. There was originally a steady state model. That was Einstein's biggest mistake in his, in his words. But uh, then there's a hesitation model that was refuted in the 60s. Then they went to an oscillation model. It was expanding, then it's contracting, it's going back and forth. That's been refuted by the entropy laws and the lack of mass. There's an inflation model that's currently in vogue, except it requires anti-gravity forces that have never been observed. So all these are speculations of various kinds. But there is a stretch factor. It's interesting that we uh, can calculate that stretch factor by the uh, temperature of what they call the quark coefficient. But the point is, is if you take that stretch factor, and I'm indebted to Dr. Gerald Schroeder, who wrote the book Genesis and the Big Bang. I celebrated Passover with him in Jerusalem years ago. The expansion factor generally regarded by scientists is about a factor of 10 to the 12th, so an expanding universe. Well, so if you take six, and they also believe that the universe is about 16 billion years old. Well, if you take that out, you know, that's six trillion days. If you divide that, uh, take that times 10 to the 12th days, but divide it by 10 to the 12th, you end up with six days. And if you take that as an exponential expansion, then each day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six would be, would be, uh, would, would be uh, the perspective. This is also tied to the speed of light. We won't get into that here. But those are current conjectures. But I want to deal with this, this stretch factor in another way, stretching the heavens. I'll talk a little bit about the fabric of space. Is that just a metaphor in the scripture? You know, uh, Job 9, 8 says, who, speaking of God, who alone stretches out the heavens, stretching out the heaven like a tent curtain, to Psalm 104. So Isaiah 40, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. All through the scripture, Job, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah uses these expressions. He has stretched out the heavens. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, Zechariah, and so forth. There are dozens of these allusions all through the scripture, stretching out the heavens. See, most of us have a misconception. We think that space is a vacuum. It's empty. There's nothing there. Not true. The scripture tells us it can be torn, Isaiah 64. It can be worn out like a garment in Psalm 102. It can be shaken. You can shake space, apparently. Um, Hebrews, Haggai, and Isaiah deal with that. It can be burnt up, Peter reminds us in 2 Peter 3. It splits apart like a scroll in Revelation 6. Here's a kicker. In both Hebrews and Isaiah, it says it rolled up like a mantle or a scroll. Space can be rolled up. We know that space has, today we know that space has properties. There's a zero point energy. There's permittivity and permeability. Every radio ham knows that because he's got to tune his antenna to the properties of space. And if you take permittivity and permeability, you have an intrinsic impedance of space, and you need to know that for antenna design. And the velocity of light is variable, we now discover. And Barry Sutterfield learned that from the scripture originally, proved it physically 20 years ago, was laughed in most circles of physics discussions until a few years ago. In fact, I had very well-meaning friends in the physics world take me to dinner, try to coach me not to fall into the trap of backing up the views of Barry Sutterfield. And I smiled at that because the last couple of years, it's well known now the speed of light is slowing down, has been changing, so it's not a constant. We'll come back to constants here in a minute. Rolled up. In order for something to be rolled up, there must be a dimension in which it's thin and an additional dimension, a direction into which it can be bent. So if I take a two-dimensional 
thing like a photograph, to roll it up takes three dimensions. It takes an extra dimension to roll something up. If it's a two-dimension thing, it takes three dimensions to do that. So there are additional, this is a clue that there are additional spatial dimensions. And uh, this leads to studies of hyperdimensions, hyper which are uh, spaces of more than three. Well, it's interesting that Paul, when he writes his letter to the Ephesians, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height to know that love of Christ which passes knowledge might be filled with all the fullness of God. In his poetic weave here, how many dimensions does he mention? Breadth, length, depth, and height. Those are four labels, one of which can, is the Greek term that can mean time. A four-dimensional universe. And that was the discovery of Einstein, that time is a physical property. We live in four dimensions, not just three. Time is a physical property. It varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity, among other things. We exist in apparently three dimensions, and current thinking in scientific circles is that we live in ten. And I think that we've just gone beyond Euclid. The most important lecture in mathematics was given on June 10th of 1854. George Riemann introduced metric tensors. It took 60 years for it to be applied practically, and that's the mathematics Einstein used to develop his four-dimensional space-time, his famous theory of general relativity. He went, Einstein went to his death frustrated because he couldn't reconcile a couple of other factors. In 1953, doing exactly what Einstein did, postulating an additional set of dimensions, Close and Klein reconciled light and supergravity. In 1963, Yang and Mills developed the fields that uh, uh, harmonized the electromagnetic and both strong and weak nuclear forces. So there's been a progress here of adding dimensions from Einstein's four dimensions all the way till 1984, where now the current thinking, since then, various forms, is that we have ten dimensions. A vibration of superstrings is the current um, uh, vocabulary to deal in that field. But it's interesting, there was a writer by the name of Nachmanides, a Hebrew sage that lived in the 13th century. And uh, he concluded from studying the book of Genesis that the universe has ten dimensions, only four of them are knowable, six are not knowable. Those are his words. And that, I find that kind of quaint and interesting because particle physicists today believe that we live in ten dimensions. Four are directly measurable, three spatial plus time. Six of them are curled less than ten to the minus thirty-five centimeters, which are uh, smaller than the wavelength of light, and therefore are discernible only by indirect means. Now what's fascinating about this is we've spent millions of dollars on atomic accelerators to discover what Nachmanides discovered by doing his homework in the chapter of Genesis. But So we're talking about infinity on the macro side. Let's look at the other direction here a little bit. Let's look at the smaller side and let's explore, ex, 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 uh, explore the field of quantum physics. We've been on the largeness side. Let's look at the smaller size. That brings us into the field of quantum physics or subatomic particles. It's, we're going to study smallness a little bit. And we're going to discover something very strange, that there is a limit to smallness. We realize there's a limit to largeness. The universe is finite. But we are shocked to discover there is a limit to smallness, and that doesn't make any sense to our thinking. The limits to smallness. See, the writer of Hebrews points out, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen we're not made of things which do appear. And uh, the model of the atom, we all made these in school. We take the simplest one. We've talked about a hydrogen atom. We've got a proton as a nucleus, and we've got an electron skirting around that. Now, this is not to scale. The nucleus is in the center. The electron is as envisioned as spinning around it. And this is not to scale. Let's talk a little bit about scale. It turns out that the nucleus is about 10 to the minus 13 centimeters in diameter. The atom itself, in terms of the orbit of the electron, is about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. It's much larger. By how much larger? By a factor of 10 to the fifth. In other words, to make a model um, of this to scale, I would have to make the nucleus the size of a pinhead and put the electron away the size of a football field. That's what it would take to make a model to scale, a pinhead in a football field. 
In other words, it's mostly empty space. But not only, this is just linear. The diameter is a ratio of 100,000 to 1. Well, if I'm going to look at that volumetrically, I've got to take that 10 to the 5th and cube it, length with height. So that means the ratio of that pinhead is 1 to 10 to the 15th. Now, that's a number so big, you and I can't grasp it. How big is 10 to the 15th? That's the same ratio as one second would have to 30 million years. If you go through the arithmetic, you'll discover that's about 10 to the 15th. One second to 30 million years. That's the ratio of solidness of a nucleus to an atom. That says if I say that this thing, this, this uh, podium is solid, and one of you says, no, there's nothing there, you are more correct than I am by saying it's solid. Because there's more nothingness here than there is solid by a factor of one second to 30 million years, 10 to the 15th. So why does it feel solid? Because it's an electrical simulation. The atoms, the electrical fields that make up the molecules of the, of the podium and the molecules that make up my hand collide and create the illusion of solidness. But it's an electrical simulation. And let's take a look at that. See, everything is made up of individual quanta, we discover. If I take a line, and I could obviously cut it in half and throw half of that other half away, I have now half that line, I can do the same thing again. Whatever I've got left, I can cut in half, and I can keep doing this, right? You would think at least conceptually I could do that forever. It turns out not to be true. When I get down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, I find a very embarrassing discovery. I discover that if I cut that in half, it suddenly is everywhere at the same time. It loses a property that the physicists called locality. It loses locality. They now have been able to prove that every photon in the universe knows what every other photon is doing. They're somehow connected. And that's bizarre. It's so bizarre that uh, Boltzmann, one of the early quantum physics uh, discoverers, committed suicide. He couldn't handle it. He understood the implications of that. There is a plaque length of 10 to the 33 centimeters, a plaque time. There is no period of time shorter than 10 to the minus 43 seconds. They're all, everything we know, length, mass, energy, time, are all made up of indivisible units. Called, that's why they call it quanta. They call them quanta. And that's why they call this field of study quantum physics. what actually occurred then. Okay. But it's also designed for an ending because eventually there's good, the temperatures in the uniform will be the, the temperatures in the universe will be uniform. All work is done by a difference in temperature. When the temperatures are uniform, no more work can be done. The uniform is over and it is destined for what they call a heat death. Now there are lots of different that leads to a collection of speculations called the big bang theories. And basically they say first there was nothing and then it exploded. If that's logical to you, embrace it. But we also know that ultimately it's all going to burn out. The universe is winding, it's been wound up, it's winding down. And there's ultimately a heat death. You see, heat flows always from hot bodies to cold bodies, right? We all experience that. If the universe was infinitely old, the temperature throughout the universe would be uniform. It's not. So it's not infinitely old, it had a beginning. That's what leads to the whole Big Bang concept. And so it had a beginning. And that's, that's clearly understood. Lots of speculation is... Now, they know that originally, they assume that... It, they also know the universe started. It began. That's what they, for lack of another term, they call a singularity. And that leads to conjectures of how did it start. And speculations about the Big Bang. There was originally a steady state model. That was Einstein's biggest mistake in his, in his words. 
But uh, then there's a hesitation model that was refuted in the 60s. Then they went to an oscillation model. It was expanding, then it's contracting, it's going back and forth. That's been refuted by the entropy laws and the lack of mass. There's an inflation model that's currently in vogue, except it requires anti-gravity.